I thought we were the protectors of truth. Democrats, Republicans, you all lie. We, a small band of survivors, are on our way to the Steel City to find the resistance. Join us. Welcome to the Steel City Resistance with Senior Airman Ward Miller and the ironclad voice of Pittsburgh Hutch Jr. laying down verbal C4 to blow away the lies and the political tomfoolery. Your papers have been cleared. Welcome to the Steel City Resistance. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Steel City Resistance. My name is Hutz Jr. I'm located in Brookline, a neighborhood in the city of Pittsburgh. This is episode 75, and I'm deep, deep down in the SCR bunker. And I'm Ward Miller, also in the city of Pittsburgh here in Mission Control. And once again, you know, I say this every week. We, we got a, a, a crazy number of stories. There's a, a ton of stuff to talk about, you know, and... What's that line from Smokey and the Bandit? We got a long way to go and a short time to get there. Yes, we do. And let's start off the evening with uh, wishing everybody in the SCR audience a happy Father's Day, those of you that are fathers. And uh, it, it couldn't be a more important time to do your best to be a good father because there's so many scumbags out there that aren't. I mean, yeah. to the point where it's it's impacting the culture in a, in a ter- horrific way especially uh, in the inner cities where these kids, these fatherless kids run around in packs and just act ridiculous. And I, I directly lay the blame on that to fathers. Well, it's a common, I mean, it's an old line, you know, anybody could be a father. It takes a real man to be a dad. And, and that's what it is. It's absolutely, you know, the, the, these guys, you know, they go out and they knock up as many women as they can. And then they think that that makes them, that somehow proves their virility and their, their masculinity. Anybody can And the government, the government facilitated it. I mean, the government did it with the, with the, uh, not the new deal. What's the LBJ's called the, uh, whatever, the new society, the great society, you know, yeah. All the money going to families to subsidize. I mean, they basically replaced men and it's just, uh, it's something that's new. It hasn't been around forever in our history of this country, but it's having a, a terrible impact. And I would just say to those of you that are doing the right thing, I tried the best I could. My two grown kids just came over and ate dinner with me tonight, so that says something. Uh, it's tough. Hang in there, do the best you can, but it's really vital. It's vital, to our, vital to our culture. Uh, so that was just my little Father's Day message. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we had a... We had a situation during this last news week, and uh, all of a sudden the other day my my email started blowing up, and uh, Ward made a command decision for the good. So why don't you explain what uh, what happened with our platform? Yeah, uh, you're going to get a lot of new information this week as far as where you can find us, because uh, I got kind of pissed off at Google because Tuesday if you didn't know, was Russian Worker Day. And on the Google homepage, they had a big commemorate, you know, commemoration of Russian Worker Day. And that's fine. That's all well and good. However, Thursday was Flag Day. And, and they couldn't even put, a, you know, an American flag on, on their site, you know, as a tribute to Flag Day. So I figured, you know, if they're not going to support this country, screw them. So uh, I made a command decision and and that's exactly what it was. I let Hutch know after the fact I had already migrated our site over to WordPress. We're now no longer using Blogger or Blogspot uh, because they're owned by Google. All of our uh, show note documents that we were previously using uh, Google Docs for, we are no longer using Google Docs. Uh, we've changed the address for... Uh, to get in touch with us from a Google address to a live address. So it's going to be scrpgh at live.com. Well, I'm sure we're going to announce that a couple more times during the show. Uh, it's still going to be steelcityresistance.wordpress.com instead of the original uh, blog spot. But uh, that that's the reason for it. You know, slowly there's proof, you know, I mean, and it's one of the things where they commemorate everything. You know, the 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 first day that Pac-Man was released, they were, you know. And this has super- been coming for a while. We almost did it previously, but the uh, infraction wasn't as, you know, bad as this one. But this one just, uh, 
Hey, you gotta, you gotta, if you're gonna put something up for the communists, you gotta put something up for old glory now. Yeah, it, and it just hit me when I was in a bad mood, and uh, I don't think I'm gonna change my mind. In fact, uh, none of my uh, home computers use Google anymore for their search engines. I've changed everything. I'm using Bing, which, by the way, actually is a, a better, a, a more user-friendly search engine. The uh, if you learn, if you do searches for images, the the uh, Bing uh, image search blows away the Google image search. So uh, this is our official beginning of the boycott of Google. I got some work to do, but I'll. Uh... I'm looking into that too. I, I, I haven't. Google's too big for me. I mean, they're the way they're interconnected. Now, the only thing that we haven't really been able to uh, figure out a way to break from is YouTube. But YouTube started out on their own. They were acquired by Google, I guess. And uh, maybe we'll get out of there too. I don't know. We'll have to uh, let us know what you guys think. You in, know. In addition to that, you know, we can embed this the uh, the stuff from um, from Blip. You oh, know, we get do. the embed code, and then we'll just embed it directly from Blip to the uh, to the WordPress dot blog, and then you know we'll totally wash our hands at Google. We're actually and, and doing we, that already. We, We're doing that already, but I'll just have to eliminate the YouTube account or whatever. And we, and we encourage everybody else to do the same. Maybe you know, just because it's a couple guys doing it, they probably won't even notice. But if we if we get the entire you know Steel City Resistance Nation out there to start and maybe we'll get an impact maybe we'll get an apology maybe we won't get nothing but they won't get any of our you know any of our money or any of our you know clicks for advertising or whatever and it's a getting. shame because they actually opened an office here in our city uh over in east liberty somewhere and uh that's a shame but i i, I had a bad feeling about them i don't know i mean why would you pick here <laughs> unless you were left cmu with... cmu is why they picked yeah them. yeah that's true uh Anyway, so there it is, ladies and gentlemen, steelcityresistance.wordpress.com. Uh, this weekend was really big for, uh, for freedom and for liberty and for new media. Uh, there were a couple conferences this week, Ward. There was a faith and leadership conference in Washington, D.C., I believe, that Glenn, Bo Glenn Beck spoke at, and uh, Newt Gingrich spoke there. Uh, and there was also a right online uh, conference. I'm not exactly sure where that was, but Jonah Wal Jonah. Jonah Goldberg was at both of them wearing the same thing. So I think they, it must have been in Washington also. But uh, we've got uh, – that's all about new media, and it, it was just phenomenal. Uh, and if you go to our website, I got three of the speakers. I posted three of the speakers last night, uh, Jonah Goldberg, Michelle Malkin, and uh, Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin had a barnstormer of a speech. I mean, I would never heard her talk this way before. You guys got to go check it out. She pulls no punches. She calls people liars. She, it's just a phenomenal speech. I don't know if you got a chance to check it out, Ward, but it's uh, it, it's not a, your normal Sarah Palin speech. <laughs> yeah, well, Sarah Palin's never been known for pulling punches in the first place. This one but here when, is so but When you give her the, you know, when she gets the mic and she's ready to go, she's ready to go. <laughs> so, yeah, that that that's worth the uh the couple minutes it's to yeah. you know that it takes to watch the video definitely check it out that one's the the sarah palin one's long you got to give yourself about 40 minutes for that one but uh the other ones are relatively short michelle malkin uh takes no prisoners either uh, juan williams made the mistake the other evening of telling her she was just a blogger and he was a real journalist and that was like that set her off like the little chihuahua she is when she gets mad. I mean, yeah, I, I did see that. That, <laughs> that was on Hannity, and I, th I thought she was going to just pull out the, the, you know, big spikes and crucify him yeah, on the spot. That was the wrong thing to say. She's been working in the business for 20 years. Yeah. You know, but uh, anyway. She's she, highly recognized yeah. in the conservative circles. You know, unlike Juan Williams, who became famous because he got fired from NPR <laughs> because he actually had his own, uh, you know, in, in his defense, you know, he had his own thought and heaven forbid if you have some sort of original thinking yeah. on npr that as soon as he did that he was no longer uh employed there yeah i'll tell you and he's uh i kind of feel for the guy when i watch him sit there and try to you know he's got a line he's got a toe he's not on fox news for being a conservative he's there for a reason and, yeah well he's there for alan combs and, and uh, to watch him try to defend barack obama in so many indefensible situations 
it just hurts me because I know he's halfway intelligent, and I just can't tell if he drank the Kool Aid or if he's just faking it. Well, I mean, he, he's not as as super lefty as uh, Alan Combs was, because Combs was just you know so far he he was he was make he was mixing the Kool Aid. Yeah, he and, was, and he he got he got uh, angry like the lefties do and everything. I mean, he's uh. And the thing was, he'd get angry with Sean Hannity, and Hannity would put him in his place, and he couldn't, you know, and he couldn't say nothing. No, there's nothing he could do. Uh, so anyway, good, good, uh, good weekend for conferences. Uh, unfortunately, Europe is sinking pretty bad. Now there was a couple key elections uh, the last couple of days. The uh, Greeks uh, elected the conservative, which I, I don't understand this part, but they elected the conservative party, who is the pro bailout party. I don't really understand that too much, but what you well, got under? Well, what that is is I, I I did follow up on that a little bit. What that is is that yeah they want to bail out, but they want to bail out in order to stay on the euro. Okay. If 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 they wouldn't accept the bailout, the the guy that was running against him, the anti bailout guy, wanted them to go back to the drachmas, and that would just destabilize right. their economic system. And that, that might from, happen anyway. I mean, it, it may happen anyway, but at least this guy is willing to, you know, try and, you know, stay on the euros, uh, and, and that would help stabilize their economy a little bit. You know, they're 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 deep in debt. They're they're in the kind of in the same boat we are, except it, fast forwarded. Yeah, it, it's a, because they've been at it longer. Yeah, but. If they can take the bailout and they can pay the money back and they can stay on the euro, it'll stabilize their economy. Whereas the other guy was just like, "Well, screw the euro. We'll yeah. we'll go our own separate way. No we'll austerity, go back to the drachma." No, yeah. And as soon as they they would have done that, it would have been total anarchy because their entire economy would have collapsed. And actually, the euro strengthened a little bit on that win for the conservatives. Yes, uh, now, on the other hand, France, who had just elected a socialist president. Socialists have complete control of the parliament after their elections. So, ladies and gentlemen, all you have to do, especially if you are an Obama supporter, all you have to do for the next year is watch France. And you will see where this takes you because they are getting ready to make a hard left, and it's going to be the end of them. Well, the thing is with France, too. I mean, they, they are heavily union. Well, sort of unionized. Well, they are. Um, Remember they, all those truck driver they, strikes where they just stopped the country? Yeah, they have a 30-hour work week, um, and, and you know I think they get something ridiculous like six months of vacation. I mean, it's total socialism, and they can't understand why the the country's failing. And, and a private business, a private business owner cannot even fire an employee on his own. You have to take it to a board, a government board, to like arbitrate it. So what do you get? Nobody's hiring. Nobody will yeah. hire anybody. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a total shame, and it's very similar to the stuff that was happening here back in the uh, early '80s, if you remember, with all of the uh, the shootings and whatnot in the uh, the uh, mail organizations. You know, and, and UPS or not UPS, the post office. And yeah, the post office. You know, the that's where the term "going postal" came from, was because these guys are in there, they're busting their ass, they're doing all this work. Then you got the other guys that, you know, the I mean, they're all union workers, but the other union workers go, you know what? I don't have to try because they can't fire me. Yep. So, so but you do twice the work. Doesn't take them long to ass. figure it out. Doesn't take them long to figure it out at all. And then, you know, you were getting guys that were snapping at and shooting people. Now, if you noticed, uh, we wished Europe well. I mean, that's where we came from, a lot of us. Uh, but I don't know how well it's going to go. I mean, I think it's a, I think it's telling. And it's almost, uh, I don't want to sound ridiculous here, but it's almost like divine intervention is striking, that it's playing this out in front of us, showing us what our future is going to be if we make certain decisions. You know, it, it, it's, uh, it's amazing that this is happening right at this time, right before a major presidential election where there's a Marxist poised to have four years of power with no give a shit of whether he gets elected again. 
Well, I mean, that, that goes back to the, exact, to the same thing we've been saying since we started the show. Anyone who doesn't study history is doomed to repeat yeah. it. The only, the only thing that's interesting is right now we're getting to see history occur. The, the, the decisions that are being made in Europe and, and France and whatnot, and Greece. Spain. And Spain. Portugal. All those countries that are making these decisions to go and lean more socialist, you're seeing what's going to happen. So this will, this should be fresh in people's minds instead of, well, that was 200 years ago, and that really doesn't, you know, this. I mean, it, it's one of the things where, okay, this is in the news today. This is happening today. This is why it's happening today. So maybe anybody that's paying even a little bit of attention because even the major news organizations the the the, the mainstream media the cbs's nbc's abc's have to carry what's going on in you know uh greece and spain yeah when barcelona is burning down yeah so th they're going to carry that they they won't tell you that it's they won't equate it to that's the same thing that's going to happen here if we continue on the path it's something that we're they, they on. won't they won't either and and these politicians it it, I, it kills me when I watch them. They're still trumpeting the same leftist things that got Europe where it's where it is today. And it's just beyond me that uh, people don't put. I think more people are putting it together. I do. I've, I've said this several times, and I'm going to say it again. I think this is going to be a landslide of historic proportions. I just really do. I have more faith in the American people than these silly polls that said Scott Walker was even with the other guy. I don't even know his name. <laughs> You know, yeah, it didn't matter. Uh, and he beat him by seven points. Yeah, you know, so. He beat him worse in the recall election did. than he did initially. Yeah, and they were calling that. I just, I don't buy any of it. I don't. When you see what's going on now, you see the James Carvels and the Bill Clintons and the Trippies and the everybody else, they're all, they're not enthusiastic at all. I mean, if they're, even if there is a positive comment, it doesn't sound like it comes from the heart this time. Well, uh, you know, and we talked about this the last show. Uh, I don't know if, uh, you know, and it could be that Bill Clinton's trying to sabotage Obama. It could be the fact that he doesn't like Obama. It could be the fact that he's figuring, well, we get Obama out of office this time and Hillary makes another run, uh, you know, because basically he came out and he, he just didn't tow the, the, you know, the company line. They said, okay, well, you know, he, he first thing he said was, well, at, at Bain Ca Capital, Romney had a sterling record. After the Obama, you know, campaign is trying to paint him as... Spent a million dollars know, on an ad campaign. <laughs> yeah, they spent a million dollars on an ad campaign saying that he was terrible at Bain Capital. Here comes, you know, the, the messiah of the Democratic Party. The first, the first black president. The, yeah, comes out and says, hey... He, he he had a sterling record at Bain Capital. I mean, Peggy so, Noonan, some of these some of these pundits and, and columnists are are getting them too. It's not just uh, not just Clinton. I've been I've been noticing around that they're peppered in there that uh, this isn't looking good for the fella. Well, no, not even that. Uh, Clinton, Bill Clinton, also came out and said that the Bush tax cuts should be ex uh, extended yeah. again. Mm -hmm. You know, after Obama, you know, the o Obama campaign says, no, we're not going to extend the, the can you know, the Bush tax cuts and da 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 da. Bill Clinton says, y you need to do that to, to help business. Yeah. I mean, you, know, you got to help business grow. And, and here, here's the other thing that, that really drives me nuts. And I saw this uh, on, uh, it, it was a poll and they were talking about Reagan. And, and this idiot, apparently, who doesn't understand how things work came out and said that Ronald Reagan was the worst president we ever had. You know, when Reagan was in office, all this bad stuff happened, and it wasn't until Jimmy Carter that all this, you know, every, you know, that we began to prosper, and, you know, everybody had jobs, and, and it was all because of Reagan. And he's absolutely right. Every fucking bit of it was because of Reagan, because of Reaganomics, because of the, the policies that Reagan implemented. It took that much time for them to take effect, but once they took effect... Businesses were able to grow. They were able the to military, hire more people. The military the, just uh, improved dramatically, but it took until Bush almost, yeah. you know, until the end of Bush's term, the first one, H.W. Bush, until we started getting the new five-ton trucks, getting the M1 tanks. You know, we started getting all the all the stuff that Reagan laid the groundwork for. Uh, 
it wasn't the fact that, that Re- it, 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 we did it because Reagan did what he yeah. did. It wasn't because Bill Clinton was some super genius, you know, and Bill Clinton left us with you know, a, 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 a huge amount of cash reserves and et cetera, et cetera. Those cash reserves wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for Reagan. Well, well the, reason, the reason that Clinton was a success, and he was a very successful president, but the reason for that is is because he moved staunchly to the right with Newt Gingrich's Congress and uh, enacted a ton of conservative legislation. I mean, he got his little backroom deals for it, but they created, oh, yeah. they did the welfare reform, you know, the balanced budget, everything. And, uh, you know, that was, that was as much Newt Gingrich as it was Bill Clinton. I mean, it was both of them, uh, but it was uh, a joint effort. Ladies and gentlemen, your weekly Jihad report, June 2nd to June 8th. 37 jihad attacks, 6 Allah Akbars, 347 dead bodies, 535 critically injured. Your weekly jihad report that I missed last week. All from the religion of peace. Definitely, one body at a time. And uh, I swear, I don't think we can do a show in this era with this administration without mentioning... Eric Holder. Yeah, apparently sen- there's a senator now who is calling for Holder's resignation amid challenges over the leak probe in the Fast and Furious. The lawmaker's frustration with G- Attorney General Eric Holder over an ongoing uh, security leak probe and the botched Fast and Furious gun running operation boiled over Tuesday with a top Republican lawmaker calling on Holder to resign. S- uh, senator John Corian, a uh, Republican from Texas, made the call for Holder's resignation during a Senate hearing late Tuesday morning. It came in the context of two GOP concerns about Holder's decision to appoint two lawmakers from within his department to handle the politically sensitive leak probe, as well as concerns about Fast and Furious. And the quote is, I would like to say that you leave me no alternative but to join those and call upon you to resign your office, end quote, Corrin said. Americans deserve an attorney general that will be an on, that will be honest with them. They deserve an attorney general who will uphold the basic standards of political independence and accountability. You've proven time and time again, sadly, that you are unwilling to do so. And quote. Um, the, there's an addendum to this story that uh, late Friday, uh, con- uh, Senator Daryl Issa came out and said that they will hold off on doing the vote, uh, the contempt vote, if uh, Holder releases the documentation that they've promised, that he's promised to release to the, uh, to the Congress, and it, satis- and it meets the, the criteria that this is looking for. So we'll have to see what happens, but if I wouldn't wait too long. <laughs> I, I think I think he gave him till the the deadline is Wednesday I believe, and if they don't get it by Wednesday, based on what Issa said, he's putting it up for the contempt vote and see what happens. Well, he got to do something because this has become an embarrassment, and it's not just an embarrassment, but the Department of Justice. When you've got a corrupt person in charge of the Department of Justice, remember how uh, the last one was treated. I can't even remember his name either. Gonzalez. Well, the one before him, the first one for George W. Bush. Uh, uh, but he was he was just beat up all the time. And this guy is a true criminal that you can see what he's doing with Fast and Furious and other things, the Black Panthers. Uh, I mean, a guy even came from his office and testified that they were selectively choosing civil rights actions based on the victim's race. Of course. And that's just unbelievable that, that we would let this stand. Congress has become almost irrelevant. They really have. I mean, they can't get things through Congress, so they just enact them by themselves, the uh, executive branch. I mean, they've been doing it since they got in office. They're, they're, I, don't even think, I don't even think, Ward, that they have held an official cabinet meeting. Because well, the cabinet uh, officers aren't in charge, the czars are. What doesn't make sense to me is, you know, even back when the Congress and the Senate 
were both democratically held and you had a democratic president, why did they still not, why were they still not able to pass a budget? Because then they'd have to tell you what they really wanted to do. I mean, you know? it's going, it's over three years now that the Senate hasn't passed a budget. That's actually and illegal. Why? Yeah. Constitutionally, the Senate has to produce a budget once a year. Why has it not passed a budget in three years? And why is the mainstream media still refusing to bring it up, to talk about it, to question Harry Reid and say, where's the budget? Again, I think they're on their last leg, too. I do. I don't think, uh, I don't think there's a lot of people uh, that are paying attention to these folks. I don't. I mean, maybe they are, but uh, the, the, the viewership at CNN is at 10-year lows. I mean, they're getting like 400,000 people. You know, at prime time, and freaking Glenn Beck used to get two million at five o'clock. Yeah, you know it's just. I, you know, it, it's changed a lot from when it back when it was the Clinton News Network. Now it's just the Communist News Network, and they're only going to show you what relates to the communist in chief. And it is. I mean, it's not even uh, credible at all. Now, this next story, ladies and gentlemen, is a very sad one that I came across. It's titled Anarchy in the UK. Amid the pomp and ceremony of England's recent Diamond Jubilee, marking 60 years of the Queen's reign, a grim truth was being glossed over. England is gradually capitulating to the law of the jungle. Last month, nine Muslim men were convicted for organized sex crimes, ranging from rape to sex trafficking, over more than two decades of se sexual violence against underage white girls in the north of England. The gang passed the victims around to have sex with several men a day, several times a week, in houses, cars, taxis, and kebab shops. One 13-year-old was forced to have sex with 20 men in one night. The kicker is that the authorities had evidence of it as far back as 1991 and could have prevented years of abuse to dozens of young girls, but complaints to the police and social workers were ignored. Why? Former Member of Parliament Ann Cryer declared that the authorities were petrified of being called racist and so reverted to the default of political correctness. As journalist Melanie Phillips puts it, in politically correct Britain, no criticism of religious or ethnic identities is allowed coming to a state near you. And so the child rape industry proceeded with repeated failures to prosecute. Who are the British authorities not reluctant to punish? A 42-year-old 42, a white secretary who complained in an expletive-filled rant caught on video about the decaying effects of immigration and multiculturalism on British civilization. For that verbal explosion, which no doubt represented of a, collected, a collective sense of her countrymen's frustration, she received 21 weeks in jail. The Islamist enemies within Britain can openly express their desire to destroy the country and yet still stay on the government dole, but a peaceful white working class citizen who's fed up with watching her country go down the drain is sentenced to jail. That's just, it's just something else. Churchill once promised that the English people would fight on the beaches and the landing grounds, in the fields and in the streets and in the hills and would never surrender. I believe uh, the average patriotic Brit on the street can still be counted on for that, but increasingly he is concluding that that might require embracing his own tribal mind. As Harris said, if there is a tribe that hates me because they see me as a member of an enemy tribe, then my only hope of security lies in standing firmly with my own tribe. England is not alone in this. The return to the ways of the jungle is evident throughout Europe, and as Thomas Sowell puts in his essay, learning from Britain's moral rut, America's own politically correct elites are pointing us in the same direction. Those elites are instilling in American youth the emasculating lie that defending yourself or others against bullying is no different from bullying itself. It is considered a case of two wrongs not making a right. A generation of Americans is being conditioned not to stand up for themselves or to defend the helpless, but to appeal to a mediating, preferably international, authority for peaceful resolution. Our tribal enemies operate no, under no such self-restraint 
and don't respect authority or peaceful resolution unless England and by extension America and the rest of the West embrace what Lee Harris calls our own enlightened tribalism and begin defending our culture as ferociously as our enemies are striving to destroy it, then we will witness the crash of civilization in our lifetime, and I believe that wholeheartedly myself. I mean, that's just yeah, a sad story right there. Without a doubt. Uh, the, and there's nothing really that even I could add to it, uh, except that, you know, and we say it on the show all the time, you know, it, it, there's a line between being politically correct and, and being civil. If, you know, uh, you could be civil with, with a person, but you got, you still got to call a pig a pig. If, if you got a guy, you know, that's, uh, whether he's Muslim, whether he's Jewish, whether he's black, white, green, orange, purple, whatever color he is, whatever his uh, religion is, if he's raping little girls, you you take him out. And if you know about it, and that your mindset stops you from stopping it, there's the definition. There, there's the uh, explanation of the evilness of political correctness. I mean, it's just uh, that, that that story got me there. The way I look at it, you're complicit. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's the same as you doing it. If you don't, you know, if you if you take it to the police and the police refuse to do something about it, then you damn well better do something about it. But when the police won't do something, that's just uh, whew. I'll tell you, we got another uh, another little barometric picture of what uh, the Obama administration has done to our families. Yeah, the net worth of families has dropped. 40%. American families have a net worth approximately the same today as they did in 1992. That's a conclusion reached, uh, reached by the Federal Reserve on the effect of the recession on wealth. The grim stats remind us how far we have to go to get back to where we were. The Federal Reserve said the median net worth of families plunged 39% in just three years from $126,400 in 2007 to $77,300 in 2010. That puts Americans roughly on par with where they were in 1992. Uh, the data represents the most detailed looks at how the economy's downturn altered the landscapes of the family finance. Over a span of three years, Americans watched, uh, Americans watched progress that took almost a generation to accumulate evaporate. The promise of retirement built on inevitable rise of the stock market proved illusionary for most. Home ownership, once heralded as a pathway to wealth, has become an albatross. The findings underscore the depth of the wounds that the financial crisis and how far many families remain from healing. If the recession set Americans back 20 years, economists say, the road forward is surely to be a long one, and so far the country has only seen a halting recovery. That's that is one of the saddest stories that I think that yeah. I, I think that I've ever read. I can't imagine how doing we, this show. We, we've been lucky in this area uh, as far as the housing market goes, as far as uh, uh, the prices, you know, pretty, being pretty stable. At least personally, in my neighborhood, it's like that. And I just can't imagine owning a house that I owe more than it's worth. I mean, after after paying a mortgage for years, you yeah, know, that, I mean, that's just horrible. And if you notice that that started when, well, this president took over. <laughs> it was actually before that. It was is with uh, his minions, Barney Frank and Chris Dodd. Uh, yeah, they, the, they started it. The you Bush know, administration and, was jumping up and down talking about F Freddie and Fannie. And, I mean, I've played clips on the show where uh, Barney Frank sat there and said, nope, you're crazy. There's nothing wrong with this. This place this is financially sound. It's good to go. And my lover is up working over there, and it was just nasty. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, good story, sad one, though. Uh, this one here, th this story, this disturbs me. And, ladies and gentlemen, this is what we have to watch out for. We have to call a pig a pig, as we always say. There's some idiots out there in the GOP that don't get it yet. There are a lot of them are getting it. That, that's for sure. But a lot of them aren't getting it. During the summer of 2009, conservative activists turned up the heat 
on Democratic politicians to protest the innovation-destroying, liberty-usurping Obamacare mandate. In the summer of 2012, it's squishy Republican politicians who deserve the grassroots flames. In case you hadn't heard, even if the Supreme Court overturns the progressives' federal health care juggernaut, prominent GOP leaders vow to preserve the most popular provisions. These big government Republicans show appalling indifference to the dire market disruptions and culture of dependency that Obamacare schemes have wrought. GOP Senator Roy Blunt of Missouri, vice chair of the Senate GOP conference, told a St. Louis radio station two weeks ago that he supports keeping at least three Obamacare regulatory pillars, federally imposed coverage of children up to age 26 on their parents' health insurance policies, the infamous unfunded slacker mandate, federally mandated coverage regardless of pre-existing conditions, and guaranteed issue, which turns the very concept of insurance on its head and leads to an adverse selection death spiral and closure of the coverage gap in the massive Bush-backed Medicare drug entitlement, the donut hole fix, that will obliterate the, the program's cost controls. Uh, some Republicans are even trying to out Obama Obamacare. GOP Representative Steve Stivers of Ohio is pushing a proposal to increase the mandatory coverage age for dependents to age 31. And once a fire-breathing dragon for repeal, GOP Senator Lamar Alexander of Tennessee hem-hawed when asked by the Liberal Talking Points memo website whether Republicans would be introducing specific bills to preserve the guaranteed issue and slacker mandate provisions. Now, I mean, at least Senator Jim DeMint of South Carolina still has his head screwed on straight. Last week, he blasted GOP enablers of the welfare state. He notes that multiple studies have suggested that every 1% increase in premiums increases the number of uninsured by approximately two to 300,000 individuals nationwide. This is something that we got to pay attention to. I don't want any parts of Obamacare. I think it's absolutely un-American that people are on their parents' freaking insurance until they're 26 years old. You got to you got to do for yourself. That that's not my problem with it, Hutch. My problem with it is these people that think that that's a right. It is not a right. It'll become it, one. They'll think it isn't. It, it, it's not a right. No, it's, it's not, not guaranteed by the Constitution. If it's not guaranteed by the Constitution, it's not a right. You, you don't have the right to health insurance, whether you want to believe so or not. Now, that being said, if you don't have health insurances, hospitals don't turn you away. You'll have to pay, but you can, you'll still go. You'll still get care. It, it doesn't mean that, you know, they check a card at the door and because you don't have your, your card stamped or whatever that they throw you out in the street. They will still care for you. They will still nurse you back to health. There will be a bill at the end. And if you don't have health insurance, you pay that bill. And, and, and but that's what health goes, insurance is supposed to be for. It's supposed I'd like to, to see it changed. I'd like to see it reformed where it's actually insurance like car insurance. It should be for it should be for catastrophe, and that way, number one, it prevents you know with this Medicare, you know Medicaid, whatever you want to call it, system we have is broken. The reason it's broken is a kid gets the sniffles, mom takes him to the emergency room, tying up the emergency room personnel to deal with a kid with the sniffles instead of calling their doctor, making a doctor's appointment, taking the kid to the doctor. I mean. But now, if the even, kid's it, not breathing and whatnot, I understand that that's an emergency go. But if the kid's got the sniffles, you don't tie up a, a, an emergency room. And even on, even at the situation. doctor's office, even at the doctor's office, it's not. It, it's become a situation where you go in for a checkup, or you go in for anything. You go in for blood work, anything at all, and the insurance company is in every single damn transaction. It didn't used to be that way. When it my be that when way. my parents used to take me to the doctor, they wrote a check to the doctor right there. You know, it was just like anywhere else, any business anywhere else. If you had a broken leg, the shit cost three hundred dollars to write a check. You yep. know, that's just the way it is. You 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 pay to fix your goddamn car. You know what I mean? You don't you, the car insurance is if you wreck. You know, yeah, if you have and that's some, the way it should be. Absolutely. I mean, it should be for something catastrophic. You if you have to go in and have open heart surgery, right. that's what that that insurance uh, yes. is for. 
Yes. That's, and that's you, and you got Republican. For, uh, I, got the, I got the sniffles and I, I need some antihistamines. Right. It, it's not for the, everything, for the checkups and everything else. And you got Republicans out there telling a business, a firm, how they're going to run their business. I think that's abhorrent. I think they should stay the hell out of that. It's not their business. They want to reform it, reform it right, reform it correctly. Don't go in well, here and try to make it free for everybody. How's the insurance company going to make any money? No, here's how you reform it. All right. Everybody out there, take out, get, a, get out a pen and, and, and write this down and send it to your congressman. Here's how you fix health care. You start, you start with tort reform. You yeah. stop these, te- these advertisements on television where these asshole lawyers are on there telling everybody that, oh, you had this procedure, now you can sue. That is the, the number one co- reason that, that costs are so high. The, the, the Democrats are never going to say that because, like John Edwards, who made a fucking fortune coming out, you know, testifying for dead babies. Yeah. Blaming it on the doctors when it's clearly it, on the doctors, it was proven so, to be a genetic thing. And, and, and the, the point is, these doctors have to pay a, an insane amount of, of malpractice insurance. That money's got to come from somewhere. And they have to defend the lawsuits, even when they win them. Even when they win, that's why Sarah Palin stepped down from Alaska. She couldn't afford to defend all those lawsuits. So she just bailed. I don't blame her. I would have too. Another thing, another way to to fix health insurance uh, is to just let 800,000 more immigrants in. Yeah. The Obama administration wants, will stop deporting and begin granting work permits to younger illegal immigrants uh, who, became, who came to the United States as children and have since led law-abiding lives. The policy change described to the Associated Press by two senior administration officials will affect as many as 800,000 immigrants who have lived in fear of deportation. It also bypasses Congress and partially achieves the goals of the so-called DREAM Act, a long sought after but never enacted plan to establish a path towards citizenship for young people who came to the United States illegally but who have attended college and served in the military. Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano, who announced the new policy on Friday one week before President Barack Obama plans to address the National Association of Latino elected and appointed officials. Wow, that's a that's a mouthful. <laughs> Their annual conference in Orlando, Florida. Republican presidential challenger Mitt Romney is scheduled to speak to the group on Thursday. Under the administration plan, illegal immigrants will be immune from deportation if they were brought to the United States before they turned 16 and are younger than 30, who have been in the country for at least five continuous years have no criminal history, graduated from a U.S. high school, or earned a GED, or served in the military. They can also apply for a work permit that will be good for two years with no limits on how many times it can be renewed. The officials who described the plan spoke on the condition of anonymity to discuss it in advance of the official announcement. The policy will not lead towards citizenship, but will remove the threat of deportation and grant the ability to work legally, leaving eligible immigrants able to remain in the United States for extended periods. All right, let's put the brakes on for a second. Here's 800,000 additional people that you're going to put into the workforce that's already crippled with unemployment and underemployment. So we're going to take 800,000 more people and put them into this system. See, how I are think, they going to get jobs? I think that... Uh, and, and how many Americans are going to lose jobs or not get jobs because there's 800,000 illegal? I just think it's they backwards. They illegal is, in their fucking name. This is a political, a political move. Oh, absolutely. Uh, in tandem with uh, the Florida situation where they're not allowing them to clean their, their rolls of voters. This is all about 800,000 votes. Uh, personally, myself, and it's about uh, it's about charging up the Latino vote. Uh, but to me, I, I mean, I, I know that we have to do something about the immigrants that are illegal immigrants that are currently living here in houses, in rentals, and working here and been here for 20 years or whatever. You can't round everybody up and throw them out over the border. There's too many of them. 
But I think the first goddamn thing you do is secure the borders. You got to lock the door. We got to stop this and make this a finite problem. We got to make this, okay, now there's not more today than there was yesterday. Now there's a wall up or whatever it is, whatever the case may be, whatever you have to do, you have to have borders to be a country. And then I think we deal with, we selectively interview every single one of them and determine if they are given, if they are bringing something positive to the United States of America and they want to be an American. They don't want to be a Mexican American or a Spanish American or a Cuban American. If you want to be an American, we're going to have a panel that's going to decide. You know, and it, it, it has to go back to to basically the same as it was when our ancestors came. We to this need an Ellis Island. You're damn right. They're going to have to go through a process. Number one, that makes them th that they have to swear allegiance to this country. Number one, number two. You can't just carte blanche give out 800,000, 800, you know, jobs or, or, or uh, basically licenses to get jobs. Yeah. When you have, uh, you know, two, when you have million, I, I don't even have the number in front of me. It's, it's, it's over millions of people man. that are under, that are under and unemployed that are Americans in this, in this country. So you're going to, you're basically what this president has just done is said, I don't really care about those guys. I need the Latino vote. So I'm going to give 800,000 of them the ability to stay in this country and get some kind of a work. And, and on my own, after Congress said no, after Congress already turned down the Dream Act, you're just going to just deem it. That's the other problem I have with it. 800,000 drop in the bucket, really, when you look at it. But the way he did this, he did it like a dictator. He did an executive order. He did it just like a dictator, and that's unacceptable to me. And and it, it's happening all the time. This is what I wanted to talk about. This is what I was talking about in the preamble of the show, is he just does what he wants, and the media doesn't say anything. They don't care. They they applaud it or whatever. So that's shaky ground, this kind of thing. It really is. When he can just do this and nobody cares, people do care, though. We're obviously talking about it. But uh, another story that's that's starting to fade from view that I will not allow – to fade from view is uh, Obama's loss in Iraq. At least 90 dead, 260 wounded in Iraq attacks on Shias. A resurgent Al-Qaeda or Sunni insurgents? Whoever it is, they're trying to reignite sectarian conflict in Iraq by murdering dozens of Shia pilgrims commemorating the death of Mohammed's grandson. New York Times, shortly after midnight Wednesday, a homemade bomb exploded here in the capital, a harbinger of mayhem. Around 5 a.m., a truck bomb exploded in Katamaya, a Baghdad neighborhood where Shiite pilgrims had begun to gather to commemorate the life and death of a revered imam who was the Prophet Muhammad's great-grandson. Then reports of other attacks flooded in from around the country. Samara, Kirkuk, Mosul, Fallujah, Ramadi, Hilla, and by midday, officials said more than 90 people were dead and at least 260 were wounded. Probably didn't catch that on ABC News. Uh, the attacks were a reality check for a country that has made substantial steps toward a sense of normalcy. A front page newspaper article here on Wednesday heralded the return of women to local cinemas. Lately, new red double-decker buses have begun operating in Baghdad, and checkpoints and blast walls have been dismantled, providing some relief to the city's notorious traffic delays. But after the first attack struck Wednesday morning, security forces closed off roads, lending a sense of siege to the capital that will continue over the next several days, leading up to the culmination of the Shiite religious festival on Saturday. In the afternoon, the government declared that Thursday would be a day off so that the army and the police could secure the city. Helicopters buzzed over Baghdad and in hospitals, familiar and bloody scenes of grief unfolded. Among the victims in Katamaya were people, some of them Sunnis, who had set up tents to serve water and food to the pilgrims. Iraq is in political crisis. Nothing unusual there, as its government is perpetually and irredeemably unable to agree on anything. But the arrest warrant issued for the Sunni vice president, Tariq al-Hashimi, on terrorism charges has angered Sunnis, and attacking Shias appears to be the only strategy they have left at this point. They have been frozen out of the government of Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki, who has systematically removed Sunnis from positions of power and responsibility. 
Reprisals against the few Sunnis who still live in Iraq will no doubt be swift and bloody. Uh, that, that, that's just a crying shame. I mean, all the Americans that died there and Iraqis that died there, and, and the way we pulled out of there, this guy Al Maliki. I mean, they didn't pay the Sunnis. The Sunnis are the imams in the villages that uh, that executed the uprising. You know, they came out and and they were promised things, and they ratted out all the Al Qaeda and everything went during the surge, and nobody ever paid them back. I mean, it's uh, this was bound to happen. Yeah. It, 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 that was one of the things that we talked about on the show. And, you know, the timetable that they used to, for the pullout of uh, Iraq, we said earlier, and I can't remember in what show it was, that that was a, a bad idea. Um, I mean, I heard but, bad tales about, you know, when, when we were, I wasn't there for this part, so I don't know firsthand, but. Like we we would like systematically we were pulling back and we were giving them the the facilities the fobs that we occupied when we were there, and they were looting them man. By the next day it'd be looted, all the stuff would be gone, you know. And I don't know, <laughs> they're they're not the same as we are. I'm just saying, you know, these people are. I mean, they're not dumb by any stretch of the imagination, but they're not us. They're not the same, you know. I heard stories in the Iraq Iran War that they just fired the cannons, they just pointed them in a certain direction. They, they weren't doing a whole lot of fire control. No. You know? <laughs> no. They'd have a tank battle and no tanks to get hit. <laughs> they, they, they were just happy that the damn thing went off and didn't blow up in their face. <laughs> it's a shame, though. I mean, so many people, so many good people. Well, earlier we were talking about uh, our uh, commander-in-chief, our communist-in-chief, whatever we want to call them. Uh, I've Bill, Air, Bill Ayer's find... buddy. What's that? Bill Ayer's buddy. Bill Ayer's buddy, yeah. Yeah. I was able to find a comprehensive list of Obama's worst executive orders. All right. Well, but this there is really good. Yeah. There have been over 900 executive orders put forth from Obama, and he's not even through, his half, ter through half of his term yet. He's... Uh, he is creating a martial law Disneyland of control covering everything imaginable. Some of the executive orders he signed recently have been exposed thanks to friends of conservative action alerts. They have compiled a list of the emergency powers martial law, martial law executive orders. Uh, get your headache medication out while you still can without a prescription. Executive order uh, 10... Uh, let's see, 10999 allows the government to take control over all, mo uh, over all modes of transportation and control of highways and seaports. Yay. Executive Order 10995 allows the government to seize and control the communication media. I don't see why they need to seize it. They already own that. Uh, Executive Order 109997 allows the government to take over all electrical power gas, petroleum, fuels, and minerals. Executive Order 1100 allows the government to mobilize civilians into work brigades <laughs> under government supervision. Executive Order 1101 allows the government to take over health education and welfare functions. We already got that. Uh, well, this is the federal government. This isn't the state government. Well, just Executive abolish the state government. Yeah, that's exactly what the goal is. Executive Order 10 uh, or 1102 uh, designates the Postmaster General to operate a national registration of all persons. Oh, we get a number. We're going to get Ex our own number. Executive Order 1103 allows the government to take over all airports and aircraft, including commercial aircraft. Executive Order 1104 allows the Housing and Finance Authority to relocate and establish new locations for populations. Everybody to Detroit. Move to Detroit. Executive Order 1105 allows the government to take over railroads, inland waterways, and public storage facilities. Executive Order 1149 assigns emergency preparedness function to federal departments and agencies, consolidating 21 operative executive orders over a 15-year period. Jesus Christ. 
Executive Order 1151 specifies the responsibility of the Office of Emergency Planning and gives authorization to put all executive orders into effect in times of increased international tension and em an economic or financial crisis. That's the that's executive order start button. Yeah, that's the go that's the go button. Executive Order 11310 grants authority to the De Department of Justice, Stedman, to enforce the plan set out in the executive orders to institute industrial support to establish judicial and legislative, legislative liaison to control all aliens, to operate penal and correctional institutions, and to advise and assist the president. FEMA camps. Executive Order 11921 allows the Federal Emergency Preparedness Agency to develop plans to establish control over mechanism and production and, dis and distribution of energy sources, wages, salaries, credit, and the flow of money in the U.S. Financial institutions in any, in any undefined national emergency. It also provides that when the president declares a state of emergency, Congress cannot review the action for six months. These people are freaking insidious. It's more clear that Obama is planning the total takeover of America via martial law, food, energy, transportation, work, banking, and health, and he has it all covered. While Obama is uh, busy pulling executive orders out of the sky to control everything inside of our country. He has been issuing executive orders to force us to submit to international regulations instead of our constitution. Isn't that the so, truth? So folks, you really, I mean, these are all real world executive orders. Yeah. You can, you can look them up. They, who they thinks that way? I mean, who thinks that way? These people are aliens. Yeah. yeah th I mean, this is not an American mind. Well, and it's not just him. Ninety percent of uh, of the things that he's going to take control of are either under the states' control. He's taking control away from the states, or he's taking control away from private business. Unbelievable. I mean, it's just uh, it's mind-boggling to think that, that that we have these people. And I mean, they've always been around, but uh, the media is just complicit. The media, the media needs to be prosecuted. They, I mean, it's yeah. it's that bad. It really is. To allow this to happen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I got to urge you, there's a couple things that you really are must watch. You have to watch, uh, what's the name of it? Cultural Marxism, uh, The Corrupting of America is an outstanding documentary that you absolutely will enlighten you to the things that are going on around you, uh, including the uh, what I talked about in the article in the UK about not defending yourself. Uh, that's just an excellent, excellent documentary. Watch it in, in, you know, different segments or whatever. Uh, the other one is Sarah Palin. You got to watch Sarah Palin's speech. I mean, that's just, uh, I always liked Sarah Palin, but I never really thought she was like, uh, I thought she brought too much heat, you know, too many lightning bolts, but she was just brilliant in her plain spoken way. Uh, of just telling the truth, and it's just so refreshing to hear that. And that's one of the things that we talked about before, where Sarah Palin doesn't need to run for office. Yeah. Sarah's a, a kingmaker, oh. and and that's because she does have that ability to get people to listen to her. She's you on know, it too. She's on it on every single hot button that we deal with. She talks about. I mean, she talks about Breitbart. She talks about Bill Ayer. She talks every everything that we cover that we think these establishment Republicans are have their heads stuck up their ass on, she covers. She's on it, man. She is she is on the cutting edge of the conservative movement of 2012, no question. And that's what we need. Absolutely, man. So go check that out. And I am going to defer to Ward to give the, the addresses and whatnot out. Yeah, seeing as we got all new addresses, from now on you can send us an email at S-C-R-P-G-H for Steel City Resistance Pittsburgh at live.com. That's S-C-R-P-G-H at L-I-V-E dot com. You can also hit us up on our website, steelcityresistance.wordpress.com. Uh, you can find us on uh, 
Facebook Facebook hasn't changed because they haven't pissed us off yet. No, and you so, know, we did make an appeal for some more likes, and we got them. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, we do appreciate all that. You, all you new members and new listeners, hey, welcome aboard. Uh, if you got something to say, if we're pissing you off, let us know. We're not going to change what we do, but we'll talk about it. Yeah, and tell your friends, you know, if if you tell one friend and they tell one friend and, and so on and so forth, we'll have a whole bunch of listeners, and then maybe we can really piss Google off, and that's <laughs> really my end goal this week. I want to thank all the uh, people over at Freedom Connector that have joined Steel City Resistance's group and that watch the show from there. We appreciate it. Uh, or listen to the show, I should say, however you get it. Uh, give us a, give us a, send us an email so we know uh, if you have some preference. We can't cover all the stories. We have like a, he's almost like an associate reporter, Eric. He, he uh, posts links over on the Facebook page all the time, so they're always there to, to check out. Oh, Twitter. Twitter. We forgot Twitter. SCRPGH, follow us. Uh, we, we, we're starting to slowly build that database up. Uh, it's kind of tough, but we're getting there. Follow us, and we'll we'll figure that all out. I wish I this was my full time job, so oh, I mean, we could really have a a good time that doing that. Fun. But seeing as we're doing this on the side and whatnot, uh, yeah, you get we we rely a lot on uh, on Eric and and all you guys to help us out. Send us stories, things you think we need to talk about, things that we talked about that you agreed with, things that we talked about that that you don't agree with that pissed you off. Eric knows that he's responded to us on a couple of things that we said that he didn't like, and uh, and we ne we never capitulated, but we did, you know. Hey, we he's did still, he's he's still listening. He's still listening to the show, so you know what I mean. We're it is what it is. We'll listen to his opinion every time. Uh, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for letting us into your life for an hour. And Ward, you got anything else? No, sir. I am over and out. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>